It's probably good enough. Okay, uh, as the title indicates, what we're basically doing here is hydrocarbon exploration for large uh, overpressure enhanced oil and gas pools and sand shale depositional complexes. This does not mean that you don't have them in carbonates. This just means we're, I didn't want to include that uh, because it's uh, make the, uh, this, this school be probably more than, a, more, uh, probably a full day. Uh, but mainly what people use it for is, is plastics anyway. You can see by all those little uh, pink dots with the pink circles, those are areas where I've worked three or more months. If it's less than three months, then I don't sh then show up. And if you put everything at work for less than three months, it probably doubles the number of dots. So I've had pretty extensive experience. The, the three stars are the main areas we'll talk about in this, this talk. One's the Gulf of Mexico onshore and offshore, Trinidad onshore and offshore, and EG offshore. Okay, uh, here's kind of my ideas concerning conventional oil and gas exploration, uh, just my how kind of do things. And when you work with overpressure zones, it's like keeping lions for guard dogs. If you not keep an eye on them, or if you not respect them or, or you abuse them, they'll turn on you at the worst possible time. Just ask hey, anybody who's been under regular and well blowout. And I'm kind of known for this comment. GIF fizz ordinarily have a trapper or trap based mentality. They look for the biggest trap. The geologists ordinarily have a rocker or reservoir based mentality. They look for the best reservoirs. The best exploration are usually sorcerers, I call sorcerers. And what they are is they're a source sealer mentality to drive from a, it's derived from a total hydrocarbon system approach to exploration. And they're usually the most successful oil finders. And as everybody knows, to truly understand petroleum systems, you got to first understand the regional geology. In the last comments, people have uh, kind of learned this the hard way. Many of the people listening to this thing is 80% of all counties, hydrocarbon assets are pooled to 20% of their hydrocarbon fields, which are usually their largest core asset hydrocarbon fields. So during periodic industry downturns, what we call RIFs, it's advisable to be, advisable to be involved in projects that your company concerns uh, core assets. It ain't always because how competent you are. Okay, uh, these are the four fields that led me to the epiphany that you'll basically see during this talk. On the upper left, you see North Sadala oil field. It's greater than 250 million barrels. It's probably end up being over 300 million barrels. It's not that big a field, aerial wise. On the upper right, you see uh, uh, the, uh, the field there in South Louisiana. It's a TCF of gas. We'll talk about that. In the lower right, uh, you'll see Alba field, uh, which both Linda Sturbeck and I worked on, and it's a ferro field. Uh, the bottom two are basically in deep water sandstones. The upper two are basically in shallow water sandstones. Okay, how, where, do, where do these occur? They occur in pressure enhanced downthrown fault nose traps and shell for slope sandstones, North Sedona, Southwest Sedona field offshore Trinidad, as well as the McPack field offshore Gulf of Mexico. That'll be our case one. Case two will be pressure enhanced upthrown fault nose traps, West Chocolate Field, that TCF equivalent field. Pressure enhanced traps also occur in slope canyon sandstones juxtaposed to overpressure shales across the canyon wall. That's Sephiro. And you also get uh, case three traps. Uh, case four traps will be normally pressured slope sandstones underlying overpressure slope shale cap rocks. That's Alba Field. And most important thing about this when you go through this, all columns in and overpressure enhanced oil and gas traps are often longer than hydrocarbon traps with normally pressured seals, which is increases the average field EURs over overpressure enhanced traps. And by the way, this occurs in salt basins and non-salt basins, but it's mostly prevalent in uh, non-salt basins. Uh, here's kind of what we'll talk about. Uh, some Mesozoic and Paleozoic basins that formed, uh, uh, formerly contained area of extensive oil pressure zones are now either pressure depleted or reduced area of oil pressure. Mary Van de Loop will discuss that. Uh, the borehole methods uh, used to determine oil pressure, drill stem tests, repeat formation tests, mud weight increases, case support changes, drops in resistivity, lowering sonic interval velocities, additional shutdown pressures are different, diagnostic fracture injection tests, and bottom hole pressure tests and sample logs. Uh, what we'll discuss, and some of these we'll discuss, but not in great detail because most people already know these. Uh, and seismic ex exploration for overpressure enhanced traps can be facilitated by uh, processing and interpretation methods, uh, mainly fault plane polarity analysis and amplitude, seismic inversion, hydrocarbon chimney studies, acoustic appeasement, and VPVS studies. 
Uh, also, we'll talk about uh, seismic interval velocity studies, including analysis of velocity and to in, uh, induce reflection sag. And I'll show you a good example of that uh, in a field example. Seismic attribute studies include bright spots, flat spots, ABO, and absorption. I'm not going to go into that a lot of, in a lot of detail. That's a whole different science in a way. Uh, creating maps on the top of hard pressure to differentiate areas wherein subvertical pressure walls or tabular pressure cap rocks are developed. And I, I, I will talk about that. And it's unusual because when you start mapping the top of pressure, it doesn't always follow a, a specific horizon. It's following the top of pressure, whatever it happens to be. Now, some of these maps will be discussed in the course. Uh, I always say we're standing on our shoulder of giants. If you, for the far as the Bible, it's the abnormal pressures by Ferdinand. He's written the best book on it. All these other people will be discussed uh, in, in this talk, including myself. Uh, by the way, if you don't want to buy Elsevier's book, you can actually download it as a PDF file online. I actually have it as a PDF file. It's free. If you kind of sniff around, you'll find it. Uh, okay, question number one. Would you drill and lease this, uh, this sand prospect? The objective stand started at 14,000 feet. Proposed TD is 17,000 feet. And the upper right, it says gas price, three to four MC dollars in MCF. You got one year lease has started about $350 an acre and one quarter royalty. Uh, now, if you look at the map, you got uh, your, your, your fault block there. Uh, you get that little bitty time closure, 600 acre time closure on a time map. You got a well drill just down depth that's dry. And then that's number one. And then to the, up to the upper right of that little blob, you say, well, number two, reach TD just above objective. And what you have to know about this, you got a pressure sealing tertiary growth fault to the north, uh, and you, to, to, you're using that to seal, and you got a pressure climbing fault to the south, using that to, to seal. Uh, you'll notice there's a chocolate oil field over there to the up to the to the uh, to the extreme right over there. So, and all this mapping was done uh, using PT, uh, PT, uh, PSTM seismic data. Eventually, it was done in depth. Exxon drilled this discovery. Transco uh, had acreage, and Exxon made a deal with them to get it. So keep this in mind. Now, uh, first question is always, hey, where's you got a seismic line across this prospect? Here's a seismic line. This is shows uh, you kind of see it on the with the arrow on the upper insert map. It's, it's north south, and you got a, a well projected on the line. This line all Sweet Lake number two. They didn't quite reach objective, but they drilled a uh, you know normal pressure all the way down. And you look at the little bitty closure you got. There. In fact, you're out of the closure, uh, and then the sand section you're looking at is right below that blue. So when you look at that and you go, well, it's not much of a closure. Well, when you go to depth, it's actually more significant. We'll talk about that later. Uh, this is the basics of uh, sedimentary overpressure systems. This basically shows when, when you have a basin where depth increases with pressure. And you do get these kind of basins. And usually it's a case where you have no source rocks. And ordinarily, in, in basins don't have a lot of overpressure. Uh, as soon as you hit that, uh, 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 source rocks is generated, you're in pressure. And a good example of that's uh, North, uh, uh, Southern Arkansas, when you're drilling the smack over, above the smack over, you're usually uh, not pressured. As soon as you hit that brown dance uh, uh, marl at the base of the smack over, you're in pressure. Okay, now this is a pretty good example slide showing under pressure, normal pressure, and over pressure. We'll, we won't be discussing under pressure. We'll talk some about normal pressure and some about over pressure. And you'll notice basically, I, I put the time range ranges in, uh, the PSI ranges in there. Normal pressure can go anywhere from 0.33 to 0.51 PSI per square foot. When you get to 0.51 for square foot, you're over pressure. Hey, Steve, uh, can I ask a question just briefly? I'm, not, I'm sorry, but uh, I had the same question as you were going through. What, what's a pressure climbing fault? You'll see that when I go through. Thank pressure you. climbing means that on the down, uh, what would normally be a, a, a offset down on slope sands, slope sands keep going on a on a fault as you as you down fault, slope sand, slope succession goes with it. But sometimes pressure climbs along fault, and we'll see that as we go through. I'll, I'll talk about that. I have a slide coming up that demonstrates that. Okay, back to here. Uh, normal pressure, abnormal pressure mechanisms. Uh, in the Rocky Mountains, a lot of it, you don't see that much dis, uh, dis equilibrium compaction. And what that really is, you dump a lot of sediments in there very fast and you get compaction's not all that great. That's Gulf Coast. Tectonic stress, you get that in the Rocky Mountains. As far as fluid volume changes, as temperature, mineral uh, increase, mineral transformation, hydrocarbon generation, crack of oil and gas, you get that in both the Gulf Coast and the uh, uh, Rocky Mountains. I'm not gonna discuss the other ones. Okay. 
This is a step tiered basin. This is taken from Tackett and Puckett's uh, article. It's actually a very good article. I would recommend everybody uh, read that. And they adapted it from Deep Pally's work, uh, Mr. Pally's work. We'll talk about Pally's work when we go through this. You have normal pressure, you have a pressure transition zone, then you go into overpressure. Uh, it's, we have a mainly corresponding classic section, you get normal pressure. Usually you start approaching abnormal pressure when you hit slope shales because there's not that much uh, sand in them. Okay, now we have a, a, a ledge tiered system on the top. And we, we've got the one at the bottom, which is a re regressive tiered system, uh, which you go to under pressure. We're not going to discuss under pressure. We're only going to discuss uh, the, the ledge the tiered uh, pressure systems uh, that have overpressure. And you know, on the, notice on the upper left, and I guess I can see here, you have a pressure transition zone. You go end up over pressure, but you come back to uh, normal pressure below that. This would be Alva Field, Ectol Guinea, big field, a giant, a world class giant field. Uh, there are also some fields, I think, in the Anadarko Basin like this. Arcoma Basin, at one point in time, that uh, Wilberton Field was probably one of these, but then pressure got dissipated, so it's not in that particular case now. Anyway, so here, that's two cases we'll be looking at, okay, two of the three. Uh, study of 222 oil and gas wells in South Louisiana, drilled below to almost 18,000 feet. They indicated the following. Most of the fields are concentrated within 2,000 feet of the top of normal pressure. Major reduction in hydrocarbon con con uh, concentration begin at recovered mud weight of 16.5 pounds per gallon or pressure gradient of 0.86. Most of the oil is pooled in normal pressure reservoirs located at or just above the top of hard pressure. 75% of the oil occurs between 16, 160 and 200 degrees, uh, excuse 240 degrees L. Uh, and this could be a function of liquids migrating as gas and trade fluids that dissolve in mildly overpressure, normally pressured zones. In fact, I think that's what's happened. Uh, most of the gas, in contrast, most of the gas is pooled in or just below top of normally pressured, uh, high pressure. Uh, and 75% of the gas production in South Louisiana occurred within 200 and 260 degrees L. Gas peaks sharply at 240 degrees L. Uh, now, the switch over from oil to gas usually occurred at or just below a hard pressure, uh, overpressure boundary, and this switch, switch over correlates to an increase in temperature and pressure across that pressure boundary. Okay, that was the way you say it in words. Here's a way you show it in an actual uh, diagram. You get a pressure transition zone, which is the lavender, and, you, and you're mildly over, you're mildly overpressured there. And above that, you got normally pressured. And then below the mildly pressure with, with the, uh, with the, with the uh, harder purple there, you get high pressure lithology. You'll see most of your oil and gas is actually above the high pressure zone. Doesn't mean you don't get it down there. It just means that most of it's above that. Okay. Uh, this is another way of looking at the same thing. I'll go over it very quickly. You'll notice you really don't get really a, a change in the graphs. You go from 10.5 pound per gallon mud in the upper left, then you go to right to the right of that's 11.5 pound per gallon. Then you go to 12 and a half pound per gallon, down to 14, which is mildly overpressured. Then you hit hard pressure in 16. You'll notice the first, first one, two, three, four slides don't change that much. But when you start getting down to the hard pressure, things change. And by the time you get down to 18 pound per gallon mud, you just don't have a lot of hydrocarbons in that 18 pound per gallon mud. And it's very uh, distinct situations where you get that. We'll talk about that as you go along. Uh, this is Sales' old uh, diagram. It's a very good one from the APG memoir uh, 67 on traps. And what it shows is if you got a, uh, a structure is filled to structural spill point, it's filled all the way down to the blue line. When you get it filled to spill point or seal capacity, and you'll notice a little seep coming out of the top of that fold, uh, it'll come a little bit higher. And then you'll notice there's a fault plane there, but you have no uh, gouge seal at that one point. So if you, and that brown light represents filled to smear gouge failure spill point. And then the uh, uh, upper one above that's filled to sand juxtaposition uh, spill point. And this is how things work on a seal basis, actually a very good diagram. Now, this is taken from a, a European publication. This pretty well explains the same thing I showed with the other stuff here. You got a 2,000 foot zone in there. You, know, you look at the graph itself, you have a fault there. Down thrown from the fault, you got these huge, uh, it shows be gas, but there's actually some oil in there too. Uh, and in that zone there, uh, from, the top, from the intermediate, what they call it, the uh, intermediate pressure down the top overpressure, you get, you get a lot of hydrocarbons. And the shallow sand, sand reduction section 
this faults don't seal that well. Consequently, you get uh, minor columns. When you get down deeper below that in the sand core section and slope section, you get uh, problems going there too. So that's actually a pretty good diagram. Uh, a lot of text here. I'm going to go through it quickly, though. Mostly what happens is on these, these overpressure sealing faults, faults uh, oil and gas burp upward along these faults. It's like your stomach. It burps, and then it seals back. Uh, and then the, 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 the hydrocarbon source rocks are in the overpressure generating cells. Uh, and also the same falls off and extend upward in, into shallow or normally pressure sediments that contain a higher sand cell ratio. I'm not going to talk that much about the stuff in UG9 and C30 because we'll be discussing that later. Uh, the bulk of the oil pool in these depositional systems usually reside above the top overpressure, like I said before. Now, the one below here is the key point. Trans transgressive system track shales often supply the main cap rocks for the large overpressure enhanced hydrocarbon accumulation pooled in marine normally pressured sediments and shale smear zones along boundary faults often provide at least one lateral sear, uh, seal. When you go to uh, uh, deeper water uh, sands, the, ca the case that in Safira, overpressure cells can form with lateral seals and source grain air for canyon board sands. And usually that's a canyon wall. But you can also get a situation where the cap rock is your seal. And that we'll see that in Alba Field coming up. And that's where you have a huge, laterally extensive uh, overpressure zone that, that in this case, is mildly pressured in Alba Field that seals in a deep accumulation. Uh, when Pally discusses this, and I think she'll discuss it even more than this, is that uh, uh, you got uh, sub pressured compartment, under pressure, you got normally pressured, sub pressured, and over pressure. And uh, uh, in general, for petroleum exploration purposes, it's, important, it's unimportant to know whether the pressures in part, compartments are markedly abnormal or slightly abnormal, uh, whether the compartment closes a thousand square miles or it's only half that size, or whether the compartment contains Paleozoic and Mesozoic rocks or contains only Mesozoic rocks or Senegalic sunks. You know, I'll kind of move on beyond this because I don't like to have a lot of text slides. Uh, we're, I'm only going to discuss the points that are in, in bold there. Uh, I've included these basically because they'll be part of the presentation you get on the written presentation. It's very important that the pattern of seals be recognized and understood and the location of seals crossing permeable beds be recognized and accurately mapped because of the seals, not the whole compartments, trap or control the trapping of oil and gas. Okay, top seals and bottom seals are like thick unconformities and explains why. In some ways, vertical seals are like thick faults. Now we go into case one and case two overpressure enhanced petroleum traps. Uh, this is from a uh, Niger Delta paper written back in 1975, but it's a damn good paper here. And what you see is MS, MFS way, which is a maximum flooding service, a downfall. This is what you typically see in uh, Cenozoic systems where the top of a normal pressure has been downfall. It's been downfall along two faults. But you'll notice when you get above MFSA, what you see is all where you get the top of that reservoir and pinch upon that fault, the fault does not seal. All the upper, all the upper uh, reservoirs are like that. But as soon as you start sealing against the, a, a pressure on the downturn side of the fault, the hydrocarbon column goes no longer determined by the impingement on the fault plane. The bottom two sands are that way. You go, well, why is the one got a water contact and the other one doesn't have a water contact? If you looked at a map on that, that one that has a water contact, uh, this one here, um, what you'll find out is you look at the map, you'll probably find out the syncline that separates this from whatever occurs laterally. That's the bottom of the syncline. You don't have that situation here. You notice also these are exhaled liquids that come up along that fault. Now, this is a situation in what we call case one or no pressure reversal faults. Pally calls these type one situations. Uh, case two is a different situation where you get pressure reversal. And this is what uh, he, uh, he was talking about before. It usually occur with the top of overpressures moved upward within the younger stratigraphic section you know, down through a situation to a maximum flooding surface located much shallower than the older slope sections deposited on a down through side of a down to the base normal fault. What happens, it causes younger basinward dipping over pressure sediments and the basinward foot, foot wall block to overhang normally pressure sediments in a contiguous up through and landward block. Okay, when thick normally pressure sediments are trapped in an up through position between the basinward ceiling pressure reversal faults, but on the downward side of a pressure wall that form the adjacent landward faults, they become focal point for hydrocarbons migrating up and out of bracketing over pressure cells from sediments down the fault plane. 
Okay. What you end up with is, is like a deep well of normal pressured sediments. And when you get that, wherever this seal between those two faults, you get fantastic fields. You'll notice before you still have MFSA going down faulted once and on the, on the, to the left there, it's down faulted out of the profile of the picture. And I modified, beware this is the modification of their picture. Now you look at MFSB, what's happened is pressures climb from MFSA all the way up to MFSB, which is the manufacturing flooding service. So you have hard pressure sealing all those, uh, all, all these, all these, all these things in here. Okay, on this situation here, because this one does not seal all the way down and give you a, a you still have the impingement problem here because you're not sealing by MFS at A. So down in here, any sand in there is just going to be loaded, loaded with gills. That's what happens in West Chocolate. Okay. Case study zero, we're going to be talking about uh, uh, Eugene Line 330. And I'll probably go through this quickly uh, because right here I can spend a half an hour just on this. Eugene Line is a big field. It's 300 plus uh, MBO. It's got 1.65 TCF of gas. It's a huge field. There's reasons for that. Number one, it's got a seal in case one fault, uh, the case, one, uh, case one kind of uh, seal. But also, it's got a huge fetch area. Everything just kind of opens up to the south and southwest. And everything, all the hydrocarbons migrating came up, came up to the zone. Also, it has an active migrating uh, hydrocarbon, hydrocarbon uh, zone that's uh, like a generating zone deep that's actually keeps supplying the field with uh, with uh, with, uh, with uh, oil and gas. And it's, that's why they can't put but they can't put back all the oil and gas they've produced already back into the reservoirs they know exist. Uh, here's, uh, here's a north-south uh, line here, line. A, A prime. You get an idea of what one, uh, uh, one, one little trap looks like. And you get an idea, you got a 1,250-foot uh, 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 zone of sands and shales, which basically give you most of your oil and gas. Uh, it's a pretty good line here, because this shows you, this is a, uh, and this shows you how you use interval, interval velocities to determine uh, where these anomaly faults are. You'll notice you got pressure walls there. And you come down, you can kind of see Eugene, Eugene Island 330 is just down thrown to that one pressure fall, uh, wall. And that's why you get that big field. Again, that field is, I believe, uh, that line one, you see the inset right on the lower right. Uh, now we'll look at another line here. This shows AA prime. And you can get an idea. The actual inset map on the left shows you where it's uh, UG9 330 exists. We'll take a look at this. Uh, you'll notice there's two wells there, the A A6 sidetrack and A20 sidetrack. I'll talk mostly about Pathfinder, what's the DOE Pathfinder well. The DOE drilled this well uh, at, uh, because industry asked them to help solve the problem of migration, how things were working in the Gulf of Mexico. If you wonder what the DOE does, that's the kind of stuff they do. Here's the two wells. One crosses several faults. That's the Pathfinder well. The other one only crosses two faults, okay? But keep this in mind. What we'll be interested in is the Pathfinder well. And this kind of shows you how the whole petroleum system's working, how faults are burping up along the fault plane, and it comes into a reservoir sand, and part of it goes into the reservoir sand, part of it goes up. And it's really a function. It's because it's the faults act as a one-way valve for fluid flow into the reservoir. Again, I'm not going to go into this a lot because you can go through it later. Uh, now, again, I'm not going to go through the whole slide. I'm only going to go through the parts of the bulk, 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 bulk thing. Fault intercepts in the path winder and AC, A6 sidetrack wells are only 300 meters of fault, which is about 1,000 feet. On the A20 sidetrack, bulk chemical and gas stable isotropic, uh, isotopic uh, Composition both argue against significant fluid flux in the fault zone sampled by the Pathfinder well. In contrast, in the, in the A6 well, uh, which is not, the, of course, the DOE well, so the Pathfinder well, A6 sidetrack well, in contrast, sediments for the A6 sidetrack well show evidence for elevated paleo temperatures in the fault zone. And it talks about the, the actually modeled vitrite reflection in the fault zone. It shows that large volumes of fluid flowing at relatively high velocity are required to produce the paleothermal anomaly. And what's interesting is that what I found out was the last comment. It's one of the most interesting. Duration of the flow that produced the paleothermal anomaly was the order of 100 years. In other words, 100 years that fault was open and flowed. And the average fault permeability of this, uh, this flow was in the order of 110 milliliters. So that's not bad for a fault. Now, again, more, I'm only going to talk about the ones that are bolded. 
Uh, discontinuous sandy intervals in the mass of shale bleeding the OA, the OI sand uh, may have smeared out in the fault, providing channel uh, channel ways for fluids to ascend. Uh, a sick fault, a, a sick sidetrack well penetrates the intersection of a miner's blade with the A fault, whereas a pathfinder well intersects only the A fault. Uh, periodic slip on the fault provided mechanisms for generating spatially limited increases in fault uh, per permeability exploited by extending fluids. In turn, the highly pressured fluid uh, uh, enhanced fault permeability by decreasing effective normal stress. In effect, this indicates migrations acted as one-way valves for fluid flow in the reservoir. People kind of presume this, but this well and this data study basically proved it. Okay, now we're going to go into how you use seismic data to uh, and processing data to delineate fault planes. Here again, I, I can't discuss this in great detail. The whole paper of about 20 pages written on it. Case in point is going to be Eugene uh, Allen Block 33. I call this case zero because if you actually learn a lot off this damn one damn paper. Again, here, this is taken off uh, Haney's uh, uh, on the upper left. It shows Haney and his group did this out of Colorado School of Mines. You get an idea where the top of the chord interval and it shows the path winding well uh, crossing the fault. They actually cord the fault plane. Okay, and then you can kind of see this line goes northeast, southwest, northeast to the right, southwest to the, uh, to the left. Here's what the pressure wall looks like. You'll notice what they did here, if you look to the right here in figure four, they use slant stack to determine, uh, uh, to, determine to, to actually uh, 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 image the fault plane. And essentially what they've done is, is kind of a velocity filter in a way. They, they, what they're trying to figure out is what's sealing and what's not sealing. And you can kind of see where the DOE sponsored chord interval is. And you can see where the high amplitudes are where the fault and where you get those high amplitudes, it tends to seal, okay? Uh, I think the production mainly starts at the H sand. You can kind of see the main, the main amplitude starts right about that zone. Oop, oop, going too fast there. Uh, this shows the same thing, and actually you can kind of get an idea of the anaphetic faults are actually pressure sealing too. I'm going to move out beyond this. Uh, this this line runs a little bit more uh, north, northeast, and, and west, southwest. I'm going to get beyond this to the next one because I don't want to dwell on this too long. Okay, this is a very interesting map here because what you what they've done they've constructed a fault plane map, and they're showing the amplitudes on the fault plane. You'll notice you got two faults over there called the uh, what the uh, EF fault and the DE fault. And what you're seeing is the, at the fault plane there, you see where the hydrocarbons are coming into the fault along that plane. All, all the little reservoirs coming into there. And when you get the, uh, south of that, what happens is uh, the, the, it, you're, you're not really sealing as well. And, and when you go east of that, you're not sealing as well on this particular horizon, okay? So what it shows you is you can actually use this to help explore for hydrocarbons and help to figure out which, which, uh, which parts of the fault are pressure sealing, which, part, which parts aren't. And it's a similar situation here. Okay, I guess that's, I got coming into coffee break one, that's a, a little bit too soon for that. I think I'll just keep talking, okay? What do you think? Can we uh, ask a question? Would sure. You like hey, um, this is actually my question. One of the first slides you showed of Eugene Island uh, on the seismic section that showed the pressure cells in purple and blue was a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful display. Uh, I, I didn't write down a number. I don't think I had it, but it was the, it was the first uh, seismic section you showed of, of Eugene Island 330 that showed the, the interval velocities. Oh, that one. Yeah. Yeah, it's up here. that one there. Keep going. Right there, that's it. This is a really important slide. And uh, just uh, talk a little bit more about the colors and and uh, where Eugene Allen sits, please. Just, just for a minute. Okay, what? again, this is the north-south line that crosses Eugene Island Field. Uh, uh, but it goes actually, you can kind of tell just the line actually goes much farther to the north into another situation up in here. Eugene Island sits right in here pretty much. Uh, and uh, the, pressure, the pressure wall sits right in here. You'll notice when you go from yellow through green down into blue, uh, you're, actually, you're actually compacting and increasing velocities. 
You have a similar what is, what situation. Is the blue? Well, here. what does the blue mean? What does the yellow mean? And what does the blue mean? I don't see a scale. That means interval velocities here are slower here and faster there. Okay. Because you're compacting. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas when you look over here, the, the green, you're not compacting as much in this block in here. Uh, because uh, for one thing, you see whether this pressure wall here in, in addition to that pressure wall there. <laughs> when you come down through where Eugene Island well, field is, it's it's normally compacting. You can kind of tell that this little fault block in here is somewhere in between. So when you go to the, and, and the typically if you didn't have the, these pressure walls, you didn't have, uh, you, you would have this kind of situation where no, normally velocities increase throughout depth. So which side is pressured and what is what is the interval velocity? This is the pressure wall. This is the case one situation where you're, yeah, you're on the up throw side of the fault, you're sealing, you're sealing down thrown to against a pressure wall. These are normally pressured sections. This is abnormally pressured uh, section up in here. What it tells you is, is that uh, you actually developed an overpressure zone shallower than you have it over here. So then the, the pale green is abnormal pressure and the blue on Eugene Island is normal pressure. That's correct. And that's why, and you're compacting is what's happening. Since you're, you're not normally pressured really all the way down through here, you're essentially uh, got a, 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 a blue, the blue velocity. I'm glad you brought that up. Let's go back, to, since I have more time, I'll go, I'll go back in through here. Okay, this is pretty key in here because you, you can actually see where they've imaged the fault plane. Now you notice they've, they've done it two directions. And the reason why you have a two different fault sets, you have the antithetic faults, which are down to the, to the north, and then you have the synthetic faults, which are down in the south. On this particular slide, what you see is the, is the synthetic, synthetic fault here you see on your field against. Okay, I'm gonna go down a little more. And discuss this a little bit more because this is pretty pretty key in here. Uh, usually, what the, what what is the implication of Haney's paper here? Because that's what we're dealing with here. For a smooth increase in fluid pressure across a moderate stratigraphic seal, velocity ordinarily decreases gradually, and transmitted waves, seismic transmitted waves, pass through the overpressured region with almost no reflection. Unfortunately, most uh, the most dangerous instances of overpressure occur over, occur over distances less than a typical wavelength, which is about a seismic wavelength, which is about two meters. Uh, consequently, quick offsets of high fluid pressure across the ceiling fault give rise to strongly reflected waves. By mapping out the amplitude of fault plane reflections on the fault plane itself, areas of sharp increase in pore pressure across the fault, as described in Walsh's paper, should stand out. And so you got part one and part two, the, when you're isolating the fault plane reflections, uh, even if they're strong as the fault plane reflections at South Eugene Island are less prominent than the layer reflections. Uh, this could be due to either small reflectivity at the fault or deterioration of the imaging procedure because you use Kirk, Kirkhoff or Steve Dix, uh, Kirkhoff migration. As a result, the fault image contains noise from horizontal lasers to terminate at the fault. You know, Haney and the other authors employed a simple slant stack, that's what we saw on that previous slide of slide four, uh, along the fault to effectively remove the layers while at the same time accentuating the reflection from the fault plane. Ordinarily, the greater the flow on the fault, the more develop its gouge, and therefore the more likely it is to be a barrier for lateral fluid flow. To bring fault plane reflections out, Haney and the others designed an adaptive local uh, slant stack routine. Uh, the ranges of angles were selected to correspond to the depth of the fault, and then slant stacks were constructed by summing over five different uh, uh, traces. Now, we'll see that essentially part of what you're seeing is a shell, a shell, uh, shell in-house program is what we're looking at. If a slant stack is shown as a wiggle trace plot with a migrated image in figure three in the background, horizontal layers effectively cancel on the stack, causing the fault plane collection to stand out. Both the amplitude and the phase of the fault plane reflection fall A very along the fault. The phase seems to change the points where sandstones encountered the fault. Uh, for instance, as moving up the fault plane from the bottom, the wave that changes shape and, and grows stronger as it moves past the JD sand, it then vanishes between the downthrown and the upthrown segments of the H sand only to, re, 
to reappear upward, up through the sand. Let's kind of go back and we'll see that. There it is right there. There's the H sand. You got talking about it. Okay, then, okay, from that, uh, Hayden cannot make quantitative use of the phase since the amplitude, absolute phase reflections may be contaminated with stacking and migration errors. In other words, you can't normally totally believe the phase of what you see, but the amplitude is the key here. Okay, part two of that may be a more instructive thing. The correlation of the fault plane with the reason for lower pressure. We'll kind of go back through this again. The attributes of the slant stacked 3D seismic data on A fault contain information about the fault plane seal, because that's what we're seeing here. Uh, Hannah and the other offers, they use Shell's seismic attributes software in house to extract the maximum reflection amplitude along the fault planes picked within small time gates. And Haney did this on fault plane A in his, his group from to the school of mine. Reflection amplitudes displayed map view on that fault plane. So really looking at, 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 a, at a, what they did is probably an s and whatever program they used. They actually mapped the, the amp, amplitude of faults. Amplitudes are shown as lighter colors than, that come and go on the fault plane. The triangle DEF, this is this right in here, uh, forms the most strikingly coherent features on the amplitude map, and its two sides, DE and EF, have geologic meaning. The time migrated image and, and the slant stack image along on BB prime, on figure six, are shown in this, this figure seven. The intersection of DE with BB line corresponds, corresponds to the median of the A, A fault and the uh, JD sand. The lack of strong amplitude south of DE, see, south of DE, that's what I was telling you before. Uh, we're showing something there. Corresponds to the median of the A fault with GD sand. A lack of strong amplitudes means the A fault does not reflect below the JD horizon, likely because the JD sand itself is overpressure. So if, you, if, if you're looking at a hydrocarbon in here, see it against overpressure, but the actual sand itself, the sand down here is actually overpressure. That's why you're not seeing the fault plane come in with these lighter colors, okay? And Excuse below me. the JD Sands. This is at Eugene Island? Yes. This okay. is a paper published, and, and, and you'll, you'll get the. the, the I see Losh. Yeah, there's, there's, uh, there's uh, Haney and Losh. If you go back up, you'll actually, let me come back up off this for a quick a second. This is Haney's paper. Losh was the one that talked about the migration along the fault, okay? Because that's the reason, one of the reasons, why, the main reason why they did they did the, the well. But they actually got this out of this because Shell Shell was working with this data. See the Shell International people here; they're working with this. So the paper we're looking at now is really the Shell paper. And what they're trying to do is see if they can determine uh, where the pressure cells existed and how you can map fault planes and figure out what's going on. Because if you can do that, let me tell you, the engineers will love you on that. Plus, you haven't got to worry about blowouts so much. Here you can kind of see that essentially you get good seal right up in here and right down through here and probably up and through here. Okay. Go back down here. This should, by, by the yellow dots indicate offset of one horizon. Okay. Let's go back down to the fault plane now because I want to kind of finish out on that. Okay. The, the lack of the north of the strong amplitudes north of EF, which is right up in here, this is north, remember, north up in this direction, south down in here. That means the A fault does not reflect above the top of the wedge formed by it and the anathetic fault. Since the anathetic fault is reflecting, this suggests that the seal transfers from the A fault to the anathetic fault at the uh, top of the wedge. And we'll, we'll go back and I'll show you that again. The presence of lower velocities consistent with higher pore pressures on the upturn side of A fault is supported by the results of Dick's type inroll velocity inversion. That's what they did. So let's go back up and see. Well, you can see the anathetic fault right there. See there? There's your anathetic fault. So they say once you hit once you hit that, you, you, you don't you don't get this situation anymore. And that's why this comes in with poor amplitudes. Are there any other questions as long as we got some time? Because there's only 10 till 9 right now. This is Bill. There are no more questions. Okay. Well, as long as I got some time, I might as well go back through this a little bit. This is the, this is the key. These, these two I'm papers are key. 
Pardon me, Steve. I, I just see now a question, which is, are your sections colored in depth or pressure? Uh, I think from what it said, that you, you had two different things going there. Uh, one was, uh, uh, I think you have what they're doing there. I think the over, it had an overlay of, uh, what did it say? Overlay of, uh, you're looking at the wiggle trace overlaid on variable density, okay? That's what. That's how you're getting that. I don't think they're necessarily colored for pressure here. Uh, on the uh, on the that's on this on this particular thing. This slide here. When you get down deeper, similar situation here. When you get down here, what you you're still is you're looking at amplitude overlay on, on on a wiggle tree. So that's what you're looking at. So they're not really color coded for pressure. What you're seeing is the effect of pressure and what it does along the fault itself. That's what you're looking at. I think that basically answered this question. Steve, uh, a little voice in my phone is saying that you have switched back to where we're seeing the next slide. So please go to the display settings and swap. No, it's not available, is it? No, not on that. I might have well, to go back. Our attendees back can see your entire screen, which which shows you know a small view of. Two. Oh, I'm, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not. In, I'm not in. Uh, I'm not in PowerPoint. I'm not in presentation, presentation mode. mode. Yeah, go to yeah. See, I might have to end the slideshow and bring it back in, right? Mm -hmm. No, no. Just switch over to presentation mode. It should it, take it. I don't see a presentation mode down there. It says it says you can't. I can't do that. Maybe that's it there. Oh, that's the background. Okay, so I think I have to uh, stop the share and, then, and bring it back in. I don't know. Would this be a good time to just take the break? You were coming up on a break. Anyway. Well, weren't we going to have Mary Vanderloop before the break? Uh, no, no, Mary's talking. Uh, I talk after the break, too, actually. Yeah, Jonathan, uh, we changed the agenda a little bit yesterday. It's fine. We're good. Nobody told me. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Case I showed, I don't That's do okay. That. We, have, we had a long talk about whether or not we would have a break before you started, and it was decided that that was inappropriate. So that's all right. Okay. But you're right. I need to get this to be full screen because you only see it really half the screen here. And it's much yeah, it makes everything speaking. smaller, so it's more difficult to see. So uh, I'm going to stop the share and see see if that's the problem here. All right, it's it. I have it's 8:51 on Mickey's hand. Well, 8:52. So um, shall we say we'll start again at nine o'clock? Or yeah, do we I'll need make it about 9:15. Give people a chance to make some phone calls if they need to. Do those those stock trades? Whatever. All right. Get a cup of coffee. Stock. Get a cup of coffee. Sell some yeah, stock. Check, check and see, see, you see how deep you are this morning. Check with the rig. Okay, I'm going to hit stop share. Okay, now why it's not doing that, I don't know. But bear in mind, I think everyone can hear what everyone is saying, so... <laughs> Slideshow so, options. Keep it so sweet. Jonathan, we, we released we released everyone to go to get a coffee break, right? Right, okay. but I think they can still. I think you're still on the hot mic moment, right? Right, right. But why, why don't we panelists work with with Steve to get his um to get his presentation back, and everyone else is excused until until nine fifteen. Nine fifteen. Don't do okay. Now, because I I can bring it up people when i go to share screen i hit presentation it comes up but i'm not sharing screen there see so if i hit share screen but i think the problem is uh when i do that everything was fine for a while until we went back i think with bill's question which i'm not blaming bill i'm just commenting that that was the point at which Things changed. There it goes. Can you see that now? Yes. Yes, okay. I can see your screen, that, and it is in presentation mode. 
One yes. Minute. Okay, it won't let me. There we go. So that, that that's working. Yeah, you want to be able to see that because otherwise it's only half the screen. We're, we're still re recording. You, you might want to consider turning it off. Okay, I don't know what time it is right now. It looks like it's just about time to start. Wait another minute. Ask. Never mind. Uh, before we start, uh, there's a question I see that uh, came up during the break. Um, the question was asked, have you seen slant stacks used onshore in Paleozoic basins? Or in the uh, answer that I've not done that. Uh, Mary Vandaloo may, may discuss that, but she's more of a geologist than a geophysicist. Uh, again, the overpressure zones are a little bit different in those basins, but it probably can be used there too. I would think it would be very useful in the Antarctic basin. Uh, it may actually help find some fields that you thought were, weren't, weren't sealed, it turned out to be sealed very well. Uh, and the Marsalis? You know, uh, Marcellus, I don't know about. Again, I've just, I've just not worked in Marcellus. Uh, and when you start going to Marcellus, that's, you're actually f uh, drilling the source rock itself. And they probably use other things, just uh, use a lot of different methods in the Marcellus, I'm sure, in seismic attributes. But a lot of that, some of that's published, but most of that's the, what people consider their secret sauce. So <laughs> probably uh, they don't release it. Another question was asked by Alan, Alan Foley just now. Let's get out of the way. Can one of the presenters cover overpressure in currently active pressure situation, such as active salt basins and domes? Yeah, you have overpressure in salt basins. Like I said, occur, you, can, you can get uh, overpressure where there's no salt, and that's Niger Delta. And I think it's the same in the uh, Nile Delta. Uh, and, but you also have in salt basins. And the problem with the salt basins on the overpressure is uh, it, next to the salt, usually it, the, the pressure situation is a little bit different because you're bringing, you're taking sand units you're, you're, and, and shales and you're making them go almost vertical around the salt wall. And so the pressure situation there is a little bit different once you get down in the inner interdomal areas. In the interdomal areas uh, where you get these uh, anticlines, faulted anticlines, Usually you'll get a, a pressure seal the down through inside of that fault, and where you and where you get pressure overhang on that on that fault block as you go to the south, then you develop a large field. And a lot of the large fields on those interdomal areas are, are related to uh, that pressure climbing fault, where it climbs to the on the down through inside of the fault. I didn't include a lot of those examples because I figured I'd, I'd, I'd be hurting for time if I put too, too much in there. Okay, I'm going to move forward now. Uh, I hope that answered your question. Uh, so we'll go onward here. Uh, this is the second part of my presentation. It's really part A and a part B. Uh, one will be using shale resistivity ratios to help determine commercial hydrocarbon deposits and overpressure sedimentary basins. Uh, this is a stuff, uh, a method brought up by Fertile. And you'll actually see that discussed. You want a larger discussion than what I have. Go to that book on normal pressure. Again, you can buy it from Elsevier or you can just get it online. If you sniff around enough, you'll find a free copy as a PDF form. That in the second part is case studies of the Cenozoic of normal pressure enhanced traps in the Gulf Coast and the offshore Trinidad and then the slope sands. Those are shallow water sands and, and slope sands deposited in Niger Delta. And we'll see two sands there one's the Quayuba and one's the, uh, one's the uh, Asango. Uh, the reason I'm using these particular examples is I mapped all these fields at one point in time. And some of these I actually were my discoveries, some I just worked on. So let's move forward. <clears throat> Again, we're using the shale resistivity ratios, SRRs, to help determine commercial viability of log hydrocarbon pay zone sand units. Well, why do I say that? Because if you have a, a, a bad shale resistivity ratio, your log pay but it won't commercially produce. In fact, the, the classic example is when somebody uh, drilled a well below, uh, below 18,000 feet in South Louisiana, they had a crappy SRR. 
and they they logged a bunch of pay, probably logged a couple hundred feet of pay. They started producing it, and of course these are expensive wells, and so they schedule another well. And before the second well got halfway down, the first well depleted. Think about that. A bunch, several hundred feet of pay, yet the whole thing depleted in, in less than six months. Well, you don't want that because those, that's a, the last thing you want to do is drill is to two 18,000 foot wells, one of which you didn't get all your money back with. The second one, you didn't even get halfway down. So you, you almost essentially drilled two dry holes. Anyway, let's go into this. Uh, so we'll talk about this. And uh, uh, we're talking about shale resistivity ratio. And this is the same thing I talked about before. It's a study of two, 222 oil and gas wells that reached TD below 18,000 feet in South Louisiana. There's reasons why South Louisiana is such a really stellar area for oil and gas. It extends in the offshore too. I'll talk a little bit about that. I'm not gonna dwell on it too much because most people are familiar with it work the Gulf Coast. Uh, most of hydrocarbons pooled in fields discovered in South Louisiana are concentrated in the onset of normal pressures, as I showed you before. And major reduction in hydrocarbon concentration can be in at the required mud rate of 16.5 pounds per gallon or pressure gradient 8.86, which I said before. Uh, the best sand developments are found in areas where the ratio of depth to over pressure is the greatest. The similar correlation is found in isotherm maps superimposed over the top of iso, uh, over the isopack map. And we'll see that. Uh, keep in mind when you get into the shallower section where you get a 50 50 sand shale ratio. Things just don't seal very good, period. It's not a question of speed pressure or not. They just don't seal because a 100-foot fault, when you get a 50-50 sand shale ratio, one little fault, 10 foot, can, can mess up a trap. Now, with the exception of a clean mass of sands, and that's why I put this in red, with clean mass of sands, this SRR doesn't necessarily work. Now, normally, uh, normally high-pressure reservoir sands with an SRR in, in the 3.5 range will exhibit one or any of the combination of these characteristics. High pressure, high reduction rate of gas with a rapid, rapid, extremely drastic decline in tubing pressure, going off production almost immediately. Remember I said about the, the getting the first, uh, getting the first well down, the second well they didn't bother to take all the way down the TD. Production of mud, silt, and shale, and plugging off perforation. Water production that's below normal salinity, and that's a real key. Once you get your water productions below normal salinity, it's telling you, you got a problem. Remember also when you're drilling these ones down in, in this, uh, this SRR in 3.5 range, uh, essentially you're, you're dealing, since you're dealing with overpressure, you're in depletion drive reservoirs. And, uh, and the, business, the water production below normal salinity is telling you something. Now, again, I got it read, increasingly high SRR values, uh, values above 3.5 clearly indicate the presence of small, isolated, and generally lecticular sandstones. Uh, and SRR is the normal shale resistivity over actual shale resistivity. So go back to this, what I said before. When you get small, isolated, generally lecticular reservoir, you got a problem. But if you go into the plan you line up, where you got two, 300 foot of sand over an area of about you know, several square miles, you don't have such a, a, a small isolated lecticular reservoirs. In a way it is lecticular in a big sense, but it, you got so much reservoir volume, you don't have this problem and you, and you can make money on those wells. And they have made money on those wells. They're like Tigre, Tigre Lagoon and those fields like that. They're just fantastic fields. Uh, if an overpressure reservoir in the area is shaley and lecticular as a result of deposition, there's 80% probability, 80% is pretty high. The well will not be commercial but below 18,000 feet. Overpressure dirty sands drilled below 18,000 feet are usually not commercial. In contrast, laterally extensive massive sands can be commercial viable in wells drilled to or below 18,000 feet. Now the probability of finding one BCF of gas per well is only one to five in, in zones where SRR value is greater than 3.5. Trust me, you don't drill 18,000 foot wells to get less than uh, one BCF gas. You just don't do it. You're not going to make money. Keep in mind, we're not looking for money or uh, uh, oil and gas. We're looking for money by finding commercial oil and gas deposits. Uh, this is a pretty good slide. It's taken from Erdlich's uh, GCAGS transaction. And I kind of modified it to kind of show what's going on here. This shows where the uh, uh, shallower and deeper uh, uh, areas of a normal high pressure occur, uh, where the higher geothermal gradient is usually equal to the shallower hydrocarbon floor. 
Okay, you can kind of see there when you get towards uh, the, uh, the shallow zone down there to the right in South Texas, you've got a very shallow. So you got problems there in South Texas. It's okay when you get into that deep area where you had the Wil Wilcox Loba trend, that's okay. And when you get down to the Frio trend, it's kind of okay down there. But when you get into the uh, uh, Houston embayment, you see have a very deep uh, uh, top of, uh, of normally high pressure there. And that's where you have the big fields there pretty much. Uh, that's where you have uh, several fields that I know of. And it's because you have that situation. Then you get the deeper Wilcox north of that, and also you get some big fields up in there too. But, but look what you got over there in Louisiana. You got the deep Wilcox being looking pretty good. You got the shallower um, Miocene and Oligocene. The deep Oligocene works excellent. Uh, and then the deep Miocene works also. So that's what does that tell you? It tells you number, two things. Outside of hard pressure is very deep for number one. Plus, you get a very long pressure, uh, pressure transition zone. Sometimes it's several thousand feet. When you get a long pressure transition zone, that means that the oil and gas that's oil that's burping up out of those deep deep, deep uh, generation cells, as with oil and gas uh, gas entering fluids, when they hit that those uh, mildly overpressure sands, it dissolves out the, the oil and it becomes comes out of solution, and you get oil fields. So you get some big oil fields in those areas. And this explains how that happens. It's not all, not all just about domes. So this is pretty much an important slide. The next one I believe talks about temperature. You see a similar situation for temperature. Uh, and this again is the reason why South Louisiana is saying, and it's so good. Uh, because you, you can go real deep before you get uh, uh, those high temperatures. Uh, you don't have a, a shallow hydrocarbon floor. That's why, one of the reasons why South Louisiana is so good. You can kind of get an idea also why South Texas doesn't work so good either. So this is an important thing to know. Remember, you, you, uh, your hydrocarbons are controlled by depth and temperature. I discussed that before, although quickly. So it's something to know. Okay, this talks about the, this is actually Farrell's work. If he had an oil and gas journal article, March 2004. If you can get that article, I suggest you get it. It's only like five or six pages long, but it really kind of gives you the guts of what's going on. And what you see on, on the right, you see a, a, a non-commercial gas reservoir. Look at all that crossover you're getting on the dense annuity. You go, oh, great, 32% porosity. Look at the SW, estimated recoverable 22 BCF of gas. But guess what? That's not the case. You go over to the left, you get an idea of what's going on. It shows the surface case, the intermediate case. It also shows you where they hit pressure here. But when I when you see a lavender on my slide, that means you hit the top of, uh, uh, hit the top of a normal pressure. Uh, which is usually, uh, 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 what do you call it, mild pressure. It looks like that's, that, that number's a little bit off, right? slice slipped a little bit. And then the hard pressure usually comes in uh, where the purple line is. But you'll notice that once you hit 12 pound per gallon mud use, you're, you're starting to get into mild pressure. And mild pressure in the Gulf Coast starts, starts at around 12, pound, point, uh, 12 plus uh, pound per gallon mud. and goes all the way through really about 15 pound per gallon mud. And using the Gulf of Mexico, what you do is you, you get these uh, uh, transgressive system crack shale sequences, and then you get a, a kind of a carbonate layer above that, a kind of a carbonaceous shale or carbonate layer above that uh, that acts as your pressure seal. And then above that, you get a long delta front sequence when you, or strand plate uh, progradational slope there. And usually the top of that, that, that particular little carbonate, carbonate layer there is giving you your seal to the overpressure cell. And, and that little seal is usually polygonally fractured and it leaks upward into the section. And that's why you start loading up pressure once you hit the, once you get above that seal. And at the deep, uh, shallower you get in that progradational sequence uh, you know, for that, 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 those shallow marine sands, uh, uh, essentially you start, you have uh, less and less mildly overpressured sediments. And uh, in the ideal situations, you get a very long transition zone, is what you do in, in southeastern Louisiana. But uh, that's how you do it. You say, well, how can I determine, if I don't have velocities, how can I determine where the top of my overpressure is going to be in San Shale Basin? So, well, for one thing, look, look at your seismic certificate on the section. If you have a, 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 what appears to be a delta front programmed into five or 600 foot of water, trust me, when you get below that, when you get, when you get to that progradational sequence, we, we look at, you're looking at slope section. That's where you're getting all those long progradational beds. And that's usually where you hit your overpressure. 
Also on seismic sections, a lot of time, once you hit overpressure, unless they uh, uh, adjust the, the uh, amplitudes for that, usually the overpressure section is not as high amplitude as a section above it. So uh, not only does the, uh, the, the overpressure section reduce the amplitude of the seismic, but it also affects the SP logs. The SP logs in pressure don't have near the deflection you get in normal pressure. Anyway, so you look at this, uh, I call the rope limit in there. You can get an idea where that red line kind of comes in. It looks like it might have shifted a little bit, but uh, that's the rope limit. Once you get that shale resistivity ratio of 3.5 below that, forget it. You're not going to get anything that's significant. That's what they say. That's the theory. It seems to be held up pretty good. But look also where you're getting that. You're, you get from 300 degrees to 400 degree F. So most of your hydrocarbons are what, 260 to 320. So you're dancing with death there anyone. So anyway, that's that's kind of the, the typical Gulf Coast shale resistivity profile. Uh, here's two more here, okay. You got one here to the left. And look what he's done here in this one on the left over here. Uh, if you get any kind of trap in here, this would work, okay. And you, this works down in here. You got perforations from 16.9 to almost 17,000 feet. Accumulated 226 BCF of gas by, by the end of 1996. So, but you don't have that three, far removed from the 3.5 line. So it's working right there. Remember, this is a theory, but it's been semi-proven, but there's always exceptions that people can't really explain. Now let's look at this over here to the right. You can see my little thing going here. Uh, look down here, it says commercial cutout depth is really right there. That's when you start hitting the 3.5, okay? You got all these sands down here, but they're not gonna, they're not gonna be commercial. So it's very important to kind of watch what's going on. Of course, the shale resistivity is plotted right here. So it, it's something that if you're going to analyze a play, you want, you want to know what the hell your shale resistivity ratio is, or ask the people you're dealing with, hey, what's the shale resistivity ratio? Is it going to be a, a decent well? Another one here. Now look down here where, where you go into go into no man's land over here. Then you, you, you emerge back in here and you actually have a window. It went back into the no man's land where you can't have any uh, reservoirs that produce commercially. And then it comes, has a window where it comes out of that 3.5 back into less than 3.5. And you actually get some pretty good wells in here. Okay. And then over here is another, another one here. This is a, a shell well offshore, similar situation. But anyway, that, that's kind of how they use that. Okay. And to me, I, uh, I, I believe in it, but by the same token, don't, you know, it's like everything. It's a rule of thumb, but it isn't always right. So you have to kind of decide in your own mind what's real and what's not. Then that's what you do in explorations anyway. Okay, now we go into case studies. And we'll t these are mostly areas that I've worked. Uh, there'll be a few that I haven't worked out much, but basically I like to stick with areas I know because I've seen the logs that seem to seismic and I knew what happened. Okay, uh, we're talking about uh, situations where faults are often juxtapose six thick, rapidly deposited sandstone, at least in Cenozoic pile, against sand poor slope shales that are significantly overpressured. So we'll talk about the ones pooled in the shallow water sandstones first, because that's what people have pretty much done until they started moving farther down the slope. Uh, compared to hydrocarbon traps enclosed within normally pressured seals, oil and col uh, old columns that overpressure enhance oil and gas traps in shallow water sandstones are often much longer, which increases the average EUR in the overpressure enhanced traps. Why does this happen? Overpressure enhanced trap columns sometimes exceed the impingement point of the major sandstone reservoirs against the landward fall plane. Remember how I showed you when you go up section in the normal pressure section, that as soon as that top of that sand hits that fall plane, no longer seals, but you get out into overpressure, it, do, it doesn't matter that much. Overpressure seals, both lateral and vertical, are simply more effective in oil and gas entrapment. Okay. And stacked, normally pressured oil and gas pays often develop in a fault block bracketed between a, a large up to normal fault, wherever, whatever direction that is, that places the top of overpressure sediments downward. In other words, you fall to the slope sections downward to get your, your pressure seal to, to, to on the landward direction. And the down dip reverse pressure fault in the seaward direction, which places the top of, uh, of overpressured sediments upward. In other words, you're, you're in a completely different ceiling section up there. In other words, you you're still have your, 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 your 
maximum flooding surface is still pressured down through under that fault, but you've actually climbed to sections stratigraphically, usually one or two uh, sequences, sometimes as much as a thousand feet, which gives you fantastic uh, 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 field situation. Now, more often than not, when you get, I'll, I'll go into that a little bit later. Anyway, that's that. So how to kind of pull the deep water sandstones, this, this is the next thing. So, and, and this I had to kind of figure out myself and no one told it to me. Uh, a lot of stuff you see in the first, first thing in the shallow water sandstone, that's that's Pally's stuff. And Pally is very good. He, uh, Pally, when he did his papers and he worked for Amoco, Amoco people knew what was going on, but it was in-house stuff, secret sauce they had, so it never got published. But then when Amoco went ahead and got bought out, they went ahead and put all the stuff on search and discovery. So if you've not seen Pally's stuff, I recommend you go ahead and download it from search, search and discovery because it's free. And he discusses the same stuff I do. And uh, in fact, it, it goes into it more than I do. Uh, the ones that uh, pool in deep water sandstone, submarine canyon walls can also create overpressure enhanced hydrocarbon traps with normally pressure submarine canyon wall sand, uh, sandstones. Summer Canyon sandstones are juxtaposed to overpressure sails in the country rock outside the canyon wall. That's what happens is it's a pharaoh. That's why it's a pharaoh so big. It's one BBO, it's one, it's one billion barrels of oil. That was my prospect back in 93, got drilled in 96. Uh, but I say my prospect, when I, by the way, when I generated that prospect, I thought it was a 250 million barrel field. It turned out to be a billion. I didn't make it a billion barrel field. The people that actually worked on it produced it as geology and geophysics. They made it a billion barrel. I, I found a billion barrel field, but I didn't make it that. A deltaic toe thrust faults may also provide vertical hydrocarbon pathways into and out of some overpressure enhanced hydrocarbon uh, pools. Alba field is an example of that because Alba field has a mildly pressured section above it. And then below that, you come right back into normal pressure. Why that is, I'm not sure, but that's what you have. So here's Pally's work right in here. And this is actually a couple of pretty good uh, examples right here. On the one on the left, what he calls type one, I call case one, it's the same situation. Now you look here and you can see all, all overpressures uh, faulted downward to the right there. And we look at all those water wet sands up through it. Why are they water wet? Well, hydrocarbons uh, move from high pressure zones into lower pressure zones. You're not going to move hydrocarbons into those and you can't seal to the right because the fault's not sealing. Remember, you're sealing against normal fault that, that's uh, got normal pressure section. I just not going to seal. And this is Duck Lake field right in here. You know, it's down there and you actually pick up a little anticlinal production there. It's irrelevant of the fault. And if you look at the, uh, the right below that, it gives you an idea of what's, look, what's going on there. The blue stuff there is where the fault doesn't seal, but then you get down from that, you get an oil field, okay? That's how that works. Now that's type one. Now you have type two plus pressure climb stratigraphy, type two. He uses a shale sheath as his example. And you'll notice uh, in that shale sheath example, you got the one gas field on, Pe on Pecan Island that sits down from. But you notice overpressures of climb section because of the shale sheath. And why does it have a shale sheath? That usually that's condensed section associated with salt. I don't think in this case it's, it's shale, it's a true shale dome, but I don't know. But you'll notice all those gas of sand, everyone that comes up that shale sheath is loaded. You don't have to worry about escaping through that shale sheath. It's just too, 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 too good a seal. Now you look down below that, you get the, uh, the, the again, that, uh, Cross section, it gives you an idea where the cross section is going. The blue is the shale sheath, and all the hydrocarbons are there. And it looks like it's sealing against AA prime. I don't know about how a, that fault, a, a prime, uh, this fault right in here is what I'm talking about, CF fault. That may be another pressure overhanging situation up in here. He doesn't go into that. But to get that big a column up against that kind of normal fault, implies that you have a case two situation where pressure is climbing particularly there too. We didn't talk about that. Okay. Okay, again, this is type one and type two. Uh, this looks very much like those Niger delta sections I was talking about. Here's one they're showing a, a, a profile. You can see the map down to, uh, below it on top up here. You can see there's no pressure reversal faults associated with little, uh, little Pecan Lake, South Pecan Lake, Deep Lake, and, and Deep Lake down here. The only place you get the fault to seal against pressure is here. You actually have an accumulation there. That's what this thing looks like. And you look like you got a little bit of a feel up here. It's probably up suction, okay? It's probably this thing right in here. 
Okay, so this would be type one kind of fault, but it's not, doesn't work, it's not working that well here. I don't want to use an example. It's probably this <clears throat> fault ceiling there. You'll notice that the contra goes into the fault, but actually you're, you're still sealing, even though the contra goes into the fault. Next we come over here was climbing stratigraphy. This is a situation where the top of slope section is here and it down falls to either here or somewhere down in there. But what's happened is the next maximum flooding surface up is actually the pressure is climbed along that fault. Why does it do that? There's a good chance what happens here is you have the, sh the you have shale smear along the fault plane is probably what's happened here. And that shale smear is what's sealing. Remember that, 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 that diagram I gave which, which, uh, the sales had? You can get that, that shale smear. You can get sand on sand. It's still going to seal. In this case, when you get the shale smear, you're sealing off over pressure. So this is Wyandotte Field. Here's what it looks like down in here. So you get all these gas sands coming up in here. Remember, you have their own position, but what do you seal by? You seal by pressure. So every sand is pressure sealed in hydrocarbon field. And I'll go beyond that. What he's showing here is one great big uh, gentle anticline. When you get these pressure climbing faults and you have faults coming into that upthrown fault, to say, in this case, say if you had faults right in here, a whole series of fault blocks up in here, say rather than having one uh, continuous reservoir here, if you had five different fault blocks in here, every one of those fault blocks would seal and work. That's another reason why these fields are so great. Okay, can't emphasize that. And that's why those fields are so big. Okay, we come back to our case study. Our objective stands start at 14,000 feet. We got a time migrated closure, 600 acres. And you know, we got gas price at three to four dollars an MCA. One year lease to start at 350 an acre. One year means that every year you got to pay your lease rentals. You got quarter royalty. But what do we have here? We have a pressure seal against the downturn side of this fault. Any reservoir that's in here is pressure sealed there. Then we got a pressure climbing fault where it's kind of stratigraphic upwards. So we got a Pressure seal here, pressure seal here. We have a whole series of wells. You have one here, which is still down to wet. It kind of is a problem, uh, but you can, you can explain. Here, you never you didn't go deep enough. Then you got a, a major syncline. Look like at the fault run through here somehow. A major syncline, that's really, that's what's really limiting this accumulation. We got several wells over here that went down into the objective. So yeah, like one, two, three, at least, at least, at least three or four wells and tag the objective of this fault block. And what's what's beautiful about this fault block is you're, you're combining both these pressure sealing faults together. So it really just feels really wonderful. So let's take a look and see what, what the real life situation is here. Oops. Okay, so now we go back to our, uh, looks like things shift. That should be over there, by the way. So it tells you somehow they got shifted. Uh, what are we looking at here? Look at this lower right down here. We're looking at the case one, uh, case two trap down here, where you downfall and you get this little well, kind of a deep well of abnormally pressure section that's sealed. That would be our myogyp section here. But then on the next uh, seaward fault, which is this one here, pressure climb section. So what happens is pressure somewhere, hell, hell, way up into there, probably up into here actually. This dip is not real. It actually, Everything you probably have a hundred milliseconds or so of, 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 of apparent velocity sag that that does not exist. In other words, that that comes all the way up in, into that the thing here, and, and you get and all that section has velocity sag. So we have a type two pressure enhanced fault. This line, by the way, runs here. That's where it's running. Okay. And here's what it looks like in real life. Look at all these contours going into the fault plane up here. Contours don't matter here. What does matter is the depth of that syncline. That well probably reached TD, but it's all, it, for some reason it didn't seal over here. There's reasons why. Okay, very closely. So this low is actually a sealing low. Both these faults seal completely. Uh, the well here, it actually, me, the well didn't hit the sand. It actually got faulted out. And they don't, they show this as probably this probably gets as low as this over here. So the accumulation is here. But how big is this field? Looks to be about uh, three sections maybe, which is what about two thousand acres. Two thousand acres uh, tra trap. Let's see how much hydrocarbon you can put a two thousand acre trap when you got a trap when you get this pressure seal working for both directions. Whoa! Look at that log over thing. Every sand is loaded. 
there's a hundred feet TVD. Look at this sand. This is more than two hundred foot sand. That's that one sand right there. Even the little Mickey Mouse stuff that's poor, poor reservoir tends to be loaded. Net gas pays five hundred feet. Look at the difference between the six hundred acre trap and this one that runs about two thousand acres. Because of that velocity sag, now you got a really big structure. Remember, this well didn't go deep enough. Uh, and, and the other well over here, where it was drilled, uh, did go deep enough. But uh, the Meekum Sweet Lake sits over here. That's what that went right there. Apparently, it was, it was faulted out right there. That's, and by the way, what happened here is Exxon went in, knew what they're looking for, and they were using this method to, to help explain why they're drilling this well. Originally, Transco had this. This, uh, this uh, half of this acreage, Exxon had the other half. Transco was getting out of the business. They sold their prospect to Exxon made it, and actually joint, jointly drilled this prospect. It was the last one that Transco drilled. So they went out with a flash, so to say. But uh, uh, Exxon came in and rather than having a time section, they precept time migration, they went to depth and they realized that they had a pressure seal in the north, pressure seal in the south. And the only limitation was that, that, uh, that, uh, uh, it's a same climb to, to the west here. So they knew they thought they're going to get a big discovery, and they did. I'll give them credit for that. Uh, by the way, this, this, I'm getting this from uh, 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 the figures taken from Clefstead's uh, article. He worked for Transco and APG Memoir 54. You want to know about, more about this field? Go back and look at that because these slide, these maps are all taken from that. So, second case study will be Cove Field and McPack Field. It's actually uh, two overpressured sealed fields that are contiguous to each other. So we take a look at what the, the lower Miocene section, this is the Marge A section right here. This is taken from James McCullough. And I talked to him uh, to, to get permission to show this slide. I talked to him because this, this is his paper. He was glad somebody's going to talk about this. Uh, they knew what they're doing when they found, they didn't stumble on this field. They knew and they're looking for this overpressure enhanced trap and they found it. Both these fields have a pressure enhanced hydrocarbon color greater than 1500 feet. That's 458 meters. And this is not, these are shallow water sands, I believe, on the, on the Gulf of Mexico shelf. I believe that is, I think it's Matagorda Island now, but I'm not sure. Yeah, it's Matagorda here. It has to be Matagorda Island. <clears throat> so what do we have here? We have a, a case, case one pressure ceiling fault here and a case two pressure ceiling fault right in here. Two fields contiguous to each other with a 1500 foot column. Cove field by the end of 1966, it produced 145 BCF of gas. Now that's a downthrown closure. It's upthrown here, but downthrown there. This field uh, by, it's found in 1988 and uh, it produced uh, 110 BCF of gas by, what it, uh, it, by that point in time. The key well is this one right here. And this is this is the, the McCullough, their, their field, the CAC field was found by understanding that well. So let's take a look and say, well, what what that well do? It looked like it hit the fault. It looked like it came up there in the fault. Actually, it did. Here is a, a line. Uh, it's north, south, northwest, southeast. It goes across it. Uh, the field sits, uh, I believe, right here. I think this is, uh, I can't see what that is. I think that's a cove well. And then you got the Union well that sits down through here. You look at a huge extension of God plane fault, but a lot of expansion of section, okay? A fault's kind of the key fault. I think that's sealing the field, field uh, on, the, on the north there. And then this is a, a, a east-west line, the, the northeast strike line. I probably should have put it in set map to see what's going on in here. There's your key dry hole there. They hit the, the sands that produced downthrown. Uh, uh, that downthrown, and it did not work. Okay, the pressure seal should be on this side, by the way. It slipped over the, the pressure wall, sits, sits, sits right there. This is normally, uh, uh, that's not true. It's actually pressured over here. But that did not seal. They hit the, hit the well downthrown in that block, but it's a pressure wall here. So they go, well, if we go up through to the, uh, this fault on those same sands, it should seal with a pressure situation, even though they're, they're water wet down through here. When I come up through them, those should produce, and they did. Guess what? They drilled and they found production up in here. Okay. There's what it looks like. There's that, there's that well we were showing. Remember, they drew, they it came in. It came in down thrown to the section. Actually, it's kind of a little fault crotch in there. And that was the field discovery up in there. Big field. It's over 100. Sorry, producing over 100 BCF gas, which is good. 
And here's the same situation I was telling you about. Here's your pressure wall here. Now, it doesn't matter if it's a pressure wall here. This is this city right against the fault down here. And it's not it's not sealed up there in this direction. So there is this, there, remember this sand is actually on this side of the fault. These same two sands are up here, but they're loaded. So my pressure, my pressure wall is, 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 is formed here and I've got production there. Now, 14, 60, by the time you hit that sand right there, you're in 16.2 pounds per gallon of mud. Look at the look at the mud weights over here. You're only in 11 pounds per gallon of mud. That's why you have this field form where you do this. So this is really pretty much a key well for kind of understanding how things work. When we go back to here, remember, this is a type one, case one uh, seal up in here. This is a case two seal over here on this section in here. So it's it's two different type of cases and it's formed an actually pretty big field because both those fields are probably going to produce over 300 beans if, if not produce that already. Okay, now I'm personally involved in this, not in this field, but I, I, I'd i seen this situation and I got a welder and had an override on, on a well, not this particular one, but the guy that, Bruce, I worked with Joe Bruce on this, and he and I basically figured out he had a pressure problem, not a pressure problem, he had a pressure seal, but also I figured out that he had a velocity problem. Here's what it looks like when, when you don't allow for velocity. This is a time migrated section. Yeah, these two wells here, and then I wanted to get a well drilled here, but these wells had already produced. You're coming in low to water contact in these wells. So how do you get a well drilled under that? And that tr trust me, we had to show this to a lot of people in industry before I could actually get it sold. That uh, that well, that line, by the way, I think it runs through there. So, yeah, so the chest, I think, was intentionally drilled somewhere in there. Somewhere in there. Okay, we go back. Uh, here's a 2D depth data. When you go to depth, and, of course, Jim Allen's a great geophysicist. He figured this out. Uh, he, he, working with the Brusso, because... My well was already drilled before this. Bruce, I want to start started working with Jim Allen. He kind of showed him that when you go to depth, things are different. And so but now look what happens. Over here on the left, you're down, you're down dip and you're your water wet. But when you look over here, when you take out the, the erroneous dip due to velocity sag, now you're high. And it worked. It's, it's kind of part of Sarah Whitefield. You know, a big significant discovery. Up in the section that gives you the sag is pretty much 14 plus pound per gallon mud. By the time you get down to the reservoir, right, it's probably around 16. Okay, so that's there, uh, there's another example of the Gulf Coast. This is onshore, the last one was offshore. So it works onshore and offshore both. Now we're going to go over and talk about the Orinoco River Delta. This is areas that I've worked in, pretty much in the East West Venezuela Basin, which is Trinidad and Eastern Venezuela. Trinidad is really just an extension of the East Venezuela Basin. It goes all the way past East, uh, Trinidad to the east. Uh, and I am, these are two fields that I had mapped. Uh, long story short on this, uh, North Sodala fields produced more than two or three. I know it's already produced more than that, probably close to three. Uh, and then South Sodala, Southwest, that, that was actually my prospect. Now, at the time I generated that prospect, I did not understand why North Sodala field was so good. If I did, I would know it was going to be a big field down here. Now, get back to what I said. When I generated this prospect, I thought this was going to be a 25 million barrel prospect. Turned out that the EURs on this are about 100 million barrels. They've already produced 70. So this, this is what piqued my interest. And I go, why am I, why am I underestimating the, the, the seal and the, the size of these fields? By the way, I've mapped all this area, all the way up and through here and down through here. And Bob Weider and I mapped all this area up in here on the Los Bahamas. We'll discuss a field over here called Port Forest Reserve. That'll be discussed here in a second. Uh, this is a this is a lateral, right lateral shear, I believe, fault through here. So and you have a big field up through. It's like a, a half a billion barrels of oil here in the, the, the Salala main field. So let's go down to the south. Here's here's our here's our cross section that's coming up next. We have a, a upthrown section that's overpressured, and we got normally pressured section downthrown. Now, what's happened? Why is this such a big field? Well, for one thing, since it's a it's a divergent shear in this area, this kink in the fault you're seeing here caused this area to cause this, uh, this area here to kind of be down drop in a divergent shear zone. But as the Orinoco River prograded its delta across that, when it hit that fault, which was actually moving because the shear was moving. 
you had sand after sand after sand. I, I, I could see 200 foot sand, some with a 10 foot shale brick, sometimes a coal brick, going down another two foot sand. So there's really a lot of sand in a little bitty area right in there. So it's overpressured here, and it's overpressured up in here. It's normally pressured down in here. So what do you have? This is a ranch fault giving you a type, type two situation where it's climbing stratigraphy, isn't it? Here's the climb stratigraphy here. This is more of a normal fault right in here where you come down through and into the slope shales. But here you come up through and it's just a situation whereby on the upturn section, pressures climb stratigraphy. Uh, it's already, by, by, by end of 2016, it already produced that much. So that, that's 2016, it's probably produced close to 300 million barrel. And this basically says what I said before. So let's take a look at the cross section across that, see what it looks like, okay? Now remember I mapped this thing, it's not my cross section, but it could have been. Pre Manzanella section is uh, that's, that's 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 actually a major unconformity here associated with the Forley Basin sequence. Manzanella section right here, and they, they just actually pronounce they pronounce it Manzanella. If you were in Spain, you call, call it Manzanilla. They call it Manzanella. So here's here's your slopes. The beginning of your slope shales is right in there. There there you get down here. It's all normally a pressure section down here. So there's my type one trap, isn't it? I'm sealing against, I go down through and I'm sealing against the normal pressure. And over here, I got the Los Bados fault where the, where the pressure is class stratigraphy. All this is, 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 uh, is uh, normally pressured. I generated the prospect as ladder of the list on, on a place where you had a uh, pop up block along that shear. Uh, it was also normally pressured. And uh, uh, I got that prospect drilled. I, I, I knew it'd be a big discovery. It's a big, big problem was it, whether it would be. Uh, uh, whether it be uh, uh, biodegraded oil or not. And the long story short, is they drilled that prospect. They had the most pay of any prospect ever drilled, any well ever drilled in Trinidad. The people were so excited on it. The whole exploration part went out to the local brewery there and drank themselves silly. And the next day when they're coming in with their hangovers, they saw a movable oil plot. And they found out from that movable oil plot that that billion barrel field, they thought, wasn't a billion barrel field in, in productivity. Only the bottom two sands had movable oil and they could barely move. <laughs> that happened, that really happened. Okay, now here's a here's a similar situation along the most, this is where the Los Biles actually ends right in here. It's called, it's called the uh, case five here is going to be forest reserve field. It's got a, a deep conduit, which is a fall and you got a mud chamber come up there. You'll notice that the mud chamber is acting as a pressure seal, and everything everything comes up to that mud, mud chamber. Everything seals. It's a great seal. And you got several unconformities in the seal. You got an unconformity at the base of the soar, forest. You got an unconformity at the base of the Moran Lafur. You can kind of see up here the upper forest clay is sealing this all. This is a big field. I think this is a this must be a half a million barrel field, four to five hundred million barrel field, and it's it's actually associated with the, the normal pressure zone. So, like I said, when you get these pressure associated faults. And traps, they're big. You're not talking small potatoes here. So you want to be looking for these. You want to know why they're there. Okay, now we're going to move into uh, uh, Niger Delta. This is deep marine sand. Before we've been dealing almost exclusively with, with shallow water sands. Although in the previous couple of slides, the cruise section itself, I think, is uh, in the slope section, slope uh, upper slope. Uh, uh, but it was only a, a bottom part of that section. So most of it was shallow water sands. Here we're gonna deal mainly with deep water sands. Okay, so this is the deep water silicocastic systems in some Senegal, deep water petroleum systems, submarine canyon walls, besides deeply into an overpressure uh, hydrocarbon source buried section in the country walk across the canyon wall. This is gonna be uh, the myopliacy, eat up Zephyro submarine canyon wall extending south of the Niger Delta platform. We'll see that in the slide coming up. This indicates that normally pressured slope sandstone sealed laterally by submarine canyon pressure wall should also be considered when exploring for hydrocarbon traps and silicocastic dipshield system. Now, this is the key thing in here. There's been a lot of wells trying to reproduce, trying to reproduce the theorem. They had one, I think in the Congo, they reproduced it pretty well. But you didn't have this as you went to the Northeast. Why is that? You didn't have the submarine canyon pressure wall sealing on a lateral seal. So you had accumulations, but they weren't all that great in the non-commercial. So you have to be aware. Know what you know, know what you don't know. Use your size wave as best you can. It's telling you stuff. Okay, I'm, I'm doing this only to kind of show you where's the field, spherical field system, depositional profile. It's just in the middle, 
middle slope uh, uh, deposit. You know, field sits right here, by the way. It's also part of the middle slope. But it sits in, 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 the, in the bottom part of the canyon. You go, you go about 15 miles south of Zephyr Field, you're out on the abyssal plain, uh, uh, the, the base of the lower slope. They actually, in, in south of that, they drilled sands down here, but they weren't productive. They, they were water, wet, real thick sands, but not productive. So what it tells you two things. Number one, you're getting a pressure enhanced seal here in Zephyr. But more importantly, the the, uh, the the source rocks you have in the Eocene, part of the stack, Inverness stack you get in the Tothro sequence, is it's, it's, that all that oil is bleeding across the canyon wall and is dissolving those gas free fluids into, into the uh, uh, Quayevo sandstone. So we'll go down here. This is what it looks like. There is the axis of Edop Zephyro Canyon. By the way, Edop was found up in here. It's a field up in here. It's a half billion barrels. When I generated this prospect, okay. Uh, generated this prospect. Well, I was hoping to be as big as that one. Turns out to be this. We, we figured this might be the little sister of that. Turns out that this is a little sister of that because lower down the slope, we got better sands. I say it's a virile field complex because a series of channel sands sealed by a like, submarine canyon wall over here. That's what it looks like. And that's one, one field complex that's it already produced like 800 million barrels, still on to a billion. Now, over here, I think that was my prospect. It did not work because you didn't have enough sand. That was my prospect too. That didn't work because the seal was blown. Th down here, I worked on Alba. It's not my prospect. I worked on had little reserves, but you know, there was problems with Alba. I didn't understand until I actually learned more about uh, uh, how, how deep water sand traps work. Anyway, keep that in mind. So we'll look at two examples here. One is a feral. One's going to be an Alba. Okay, here's our mud diapers right in here. Remember, you have extension. This is my slide, by the way. I drew this myself. I'd probably change it a little bit because I know more about how all this works, but it's good math. So here, here you have the uptick section where everything's uh, extension, essential glide plane faults, and you get fields up, up thrown to these. And of course, the better fields are the one under seal by pressure. Then you come into what's called the translational area of the whole sequence because this is all sliding base work. Here you're extending, and the things are falling apart. Here, it's part of the mud diapers where they, they come up along here and they come up as mud diapers, uh, somewhat similar to what you have in Trinidad, but not quite the same. Usually the fields here are smaller and you have problems with, uh, uh, with heavy oil. And then, then you come south of here into the, what I call the down dip toe thrusted sequence. There sits the fear. It doesn't look that big here. That's a big barrel field. And then you got over here, you got the one that the last toe thrust out there gives you alba field here. Now, this is the top of mild pressure right in here. Actually, mild pressure sits right in here. And you're still in mild pressure right there. The top of hard pressure comes in down here. That pressure seals why this, this field here is so big. It's a big field. That's uh, made marathon a lot of money. Okay, so keep that cross-section in mind. And remember, I drew that back in what, 2004. Okay, here's a map on the field. field. This is Again, from 1998 media presentation, that's why I can use it. Uh, Zafiro Discovery sets over here. It's all part of Zafiro. Actually, when I first had this, I, pre I presented this as separate prospects, Zafiro being the biggest one because I had the biggest trap. And then uh, Tapasu was not quite as big, but the question is how long a fluid colony had on that. And then you had the Jade platform over here in Silvertina. So all these confined. Uh, perform that now. Where's your pressure wall? There's your overpressured shales here. Remember, what you're looking at is a series of series of faults that run this direction that are overthrusted to the southeast, and then within those uh, intricate stack of, of thrust faults, you have Eocene source rocks that they, they generate oil and gas and blend across into the canyon wall. It gives you this the seal over here, and that's why this is so big. Okay. Worldwide, that's where this is. That's in, off the south flank of the Niger Delta. These are all Quibo sandstones, by the way. Uh, here's what my, like, what I call my uh, case of study, six study, but it's my type three trap. There's a type four too, and that'll come up. Uh, it's an over, over pressure enhanced trap, okay? Although no faults involved. Here's a question whether it's fault or not, because actually a fault that comes down in here, but it doesn't seem to extend all the way down the fault plane. So I wouldn't call it a fault trap. What's really causing the trap here is all this section up here is overpressured. It's down overpressured. Down there, it's overpressured here. So some canyon, it's all overpressured. 
So if it, as the canyon wall climbs, you've got a pressure wall here and over here, over pressure sediments here. All this section is normally pressured. Now this, what appears to be a very long sandstone, that's actually, uh, if you look at it, it's a very long, it's a channel sand where you get, it's a very long piece of it that's come up, come up along the canyon wall. It had a gas cap up here. And I originally showed this to Exxon, Exxon before they came to Exxon Mobil. The geophysicist didn't like the track. He said, well, it's nothing but a, a gas trail. And I said, well, yes, you got a very high amplitude gas sand at the top. But if you follow the reflectivity of that sand, it's still high reflectivity below that. Maybe there's just a real long hydrocarbon column. Now, in all fairness, he could have been right. Turned out I was right. And that's what made the field so big. It had like an 800 to 1,000 foot oil column. That's long for, for an oil column. And that's one of the reasons why the field's so big. But keep this in mind. Normally pressured section, sandstone right above it, thick sandstone. When I say thick sandstone, these are like 100, 120 foot thick sandstone. They're boxcar sands. They have about a one to, to two Darcy's of uh, permeability. Uh, and they, they're, they're, I think it's anywhere from 32 to 36 percent porosity. In fact, you have to gravel pack the hell out of these sands to keep come, up, come back up the hole at you, and, and they flow like bandits, as you'd expect. Okay, do you have a similar situation in the Gulf Coast? You betcha you do. In, in the Wilcox Canyon, you got it, but most people don't have not really produ produced even as reasons for that. Uh, in the Hackberry slides, you got one over here at the west side of uh, Chambers County. You got a Hackberry slide with Hackberry sands in here. Similar to, similar to the uh, Pliocene point, you got them here, uh, and they produced a pretty good side field. The field similar to the Plangolina slides run all through here. These Plangolina slides, what they're such big, you get overhead enhanced trap. You get out of get out of the canyon wall when it's, because the, the slides are giving you a canyon wall. That canyon wall is giving you your overpressure enhanced seal, and you got these thick thick pressured sands. Most of these look pretty anywhere from 16, 18,000 feet deep. But the thing is, there's so, such massive sand, you don't have to worry about your SRR, it just goes off scale. It's, you know, it's less than 3.5, it works great. You pro, in the harangue situation, down against this harangue little uh, slide in here, you get a harangue slider, it works good. Remember, in South Louisiana, it's just it's like the, it's the fairy land of gas plays. Okay, now we're into K7. This is Alba uh, giant uh, gas condensate film. When I say giant, it's a really a big one. Uh, if I could have come up next, kind of how much is produced. I think it's two to four TCF of gas and 315 to a half a billion barrels cut. It's a huge field. Uh, remember, here's our over thrusted toe thrust wedge. The ferrule would be somewhere kind of in here. Uh, actually, one prospect was drilled in there, but it was a little narrow area. It had a channel, actually, did flow some oil, but it wasn't commercial. On this, this, this part of the over thrusted wedge, when you go to the west, uh, you have the Zafiro Canyon is cut down through here, and you get all this nested channel co uh, complex here in Zafiro. But and look here, here's your overpressure wall here, and it comes back down through here. So this is all overpressure wall here, overpressure wall here. You come below it here, you're, you're, no, you're in the pre uh, uh, normal pressure again. But the portion that seals against this, which is the Quaibo, so you have a few of the sands up here that are mildly overpressured because of that. When you hit the uh, side of the sands over here, they're actually normal pressure. Uh, it's a situation where somewhere laterally, the, the Songo sand, sands are somehow unconforming. It's, the, 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 probably the Songo sands formed against, or the, the unconformity that separates the Songo from the Coelho. Something's happened where those sands have come up against the uh, normally pressured sections. So all the, all the pressures bled off those sands. Uh, this gas plume we'll see right here. We'll see it in the next slide too. I have a, a map that shows it. By the way, there's the base of tertiary here. The Sango sands are, I believe, upper Miocene age. The Quibo sands are mild Pliocene age, mostly Pliocene. So here's our here's the size of our field. That's that's almost two miles. That's about two miles would be about right there, zero to two miles. That's how big this field is. A really big field. And it's a gas. What you saw for a gas seat, there's several of them. It's so big, it's got multiple gas seats. The big one comes where right here you have a situation where a, a little fault crotch here. That, this is leaking, it's not giving a good seal. Even though you got an overpressure seal, because it's mildly not overpressure, not full overpressure, it doesn't form as good enough seal. If it did, you'd probably have even more gas than what you do. But then again, it kind of depends on, on, on what you have to the northeast. Spill points up in here, okay? Alba field, five TCF gas and 300 million barrels of condensate. Now, I'm not sure the five is right, and I'm not sure the 300 is too, uh, too low. 
But this is what I call my type four overpressure enhanced trap in deep water slope sandstone. Again, this comes out of a paper I wrote in 2004. Now, before I wrote this paper, nobody was, was talking much about this. But after I wrote this paper, then you started seeing papers coming out of mobile. You started seeing papers coming out of Exxon about this because I'd kind of exposed the secret sauce of how all this works. And people started publishing it because the secret was out. Before that, the secret was stayed with me. Okay, here's what it looks like, case four trap looks like. There's, there's my last thrust in the series. This is Abelfield. There's the Asango sands up in here. And Quay was actually mildly pressured too here. Here's my overpressured uh, cap rocks, base of overly pressured section runs through here. All this is normally pressured. Where does hard pressure comes in? It comes all the way down in here. But even though it's just mildly overpressured, it's pressured enough to keep all this in, a combination of those sands and this sand. When I say it's uh, producing, these are also productive too. They're mainly uh, uh, gas kind of, so just like this stuff up in here. And when you come up above here, the base of shallow, you normally pressure section. Remember what I said about the progradational front? There, there's your prograding shales come down on the top of this uh, 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 normal pressure up in there. And, and you can see it, but you can see actually steep dips in this product. So every, every time, anytime you see that steep progradation, that means you're probably going into slope shales and sand shale sequence, and probably you're coming into at least mildly overpressure set, section. And again, main pressure enhanced seal is, is cap rock, is, 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 that, is that overpressure section. Okay, we are at, oh, what's the main problems associated with these case four traps? Number one, they're often located at 16,000 foot well depths, onshore or offshore. And now you're talking about more expensive, okay? And some of that 16,000 feet, maybe three or 4,000 or 5,000 feet of water, but still it costs a lot. You start going to that kind of drill depths and drilling in deep water, it's not cheap. Uh, case four prospects ordinarily demand at least four strings of pipe to drill producing hydrocarbon. Why is that? Well, you're going to probably set one string of pipe shallow. And as, you, as soon as you hit the top of pressure, you have another set of pipe. And then when you come out of this, uh, the, the normal pressure back into normal pressure, you got another set of pipes. So right there, you set what, one, two, three sets, three strings of pipe at least already. Plus, if you hit a stray gas sand within that old pressure zone, now you talk about setting another string of pipe just to get below that. You know, that is to load the hell out of the mudway to kind of to get it to go away. And even that's problematic, especially in 16 pound, pound per pound mud. So, so you talk about usually four strings of pipe. And if you poor boy it, or you think you're smart, if you think you're clever, don't be, because you're going to have problems. Another problem, this, this shows a seismic line offshore of fence again. Uh, so that's well as location was projected onto the line to demonstrate this play. By the way, I met the guy who sold this play to Tolo. And I was giving a talk down in Trinidad. And I think it was on something, it wasn't about overpressure, about something else. I met the guy, I had an override on that play, by the way. I got 1% was for uh, contractor share. That, that would have made, if that well would have worked, and I think it would have been productive, the guy would have made it probably a couple hundred million dollars. He, needs, uh, he, just, he told me where his day as well. And I said, well, I'd mapped the submarine canyon in Guyana. You had a lot of prograding, prograding deltaics in that area. Are there prograding deltaics and, and, and uh, prograding sands in, in the area? Is this, is this, are they giving you a pressure seal? I, he said, yes. I said, do you have to go from normal to abnormal back, back to normal again to do the deltaics? He said, yes. I said, there's a good chance you won't drill, you won't get any production out of that. You'll, you'll drill a couple, two, three wells and you'll have problems. I said, also, you have problems because you're trying to image, trying to image seismic below a normally pressured zone. You have problems getting signal through it. And also, you have problems in, in velocities because, you know, you, you know, the deeper you get, especially 16,000 feet, your, your contrary velocity plus aren't working as good as they are at, say, 12, 13,000 feet. So it turns out I was right. A shell drilled two or three wells on this and determined it wasn't big enough, that the sands where it contains wasn't big enough, and it just cost too much to do it. So essentially, it never got produced. So again, understand you're deal, dealing with these case four traps, you got problems. Now, let's say you take case, case four trap into the Antarctica Basin. They got case four traps there too. You got similar problems. You're going to drill at 16,000 feet plus well depth, depths. You're going to talk about four string of pipes, especially if you're drilling the hunting limestone, hunting, you have to hunt in the car, camel organization, one of those two, get one of those two reservoirs. You're going to have to deal with that. And you got velocity problems. So you have to worry about that. So 
that's to me stuff you just do diligence to do. Okay, so we go back. There are four types of overpressure enhanced trap type one, type two, type three, type four. One's just a simple down throw and trap. And it can be a three way down throw enclosure. It doesn't have to be uh, sealed up there uh, by, by another fault. And I've seen uh, and a lot, a lot of, by the way, a lot of these have been missed because people, especially in international sense, they do not like drilling three way closures down thrown. If they don't understand the pressure seal, there's no way they drill those. But if they do, you can go back in old databases where, well, maybe one of these is, maybe I've missed one of these. Well, yeah, you probably have. Up thrown pressure seal traps, which is really a combination of type two and type one, those work. Can you all pressure seal traps low stance known? That's type three. I showed you that. It's a theory. Traps are normally pressure rock seal by over a cast rock that's mainly uh, going to be in, uh, in slope sandstones, which is going to be uh, alba kind of things. But you also get it in, in these four elevations. You get offshore, like the uh, uh, like the uh, Antarctica basin. So most overpressure high de enhanced hydrocarbon traps and Cenozoic sand shield ribs will just create up thrown fault closures. Normally, they're shallow water sandstone, but some of the deeper part of the sands are actually you know, uh, slope sands. West Chocolate Field is a good example of it. Uh, but there's uh, in Bob West, Bob West feels a similar situation. Bob West looks just like West Chocolate. You got a fault crotch up thrown, you got up thrown, you, you have a down, you have a down thrown seal against pressure. You got an up thrown seal because of fault, fault to the east of it. Essentially, pressure is climbed. If, if, if I change the angle of math, instead of going east west and north south, Bob West looks like just a look alike to that. And the people were looking for this when they drilled this part where they they knew about this situation. So not like you can't predict it when you do it. And this is important because in exploration, it's not just about uh, doing a bunch of wild stuff. We all know that you're going to have to be able to predict. Remember I said, what got, what put the B in my bonnet was I had two fields, one which was a 25 million barrel field. It turned out to be a hundred million barrel field because I didn't understand it. The other one turned out to be a billion barrel field because I couldn't put more than 250 million barrels into the prospect that I generated. So I didn't understand it as a consequence of that. That's that's how I learned all this. And remember, at this point in time, none of that situation with the Amico stuff had been released. I didn't have access to Pally's work. I got it later when they should it in 2014. But by, by really by the year 2000, I understood pretty much everything I know right now. And I've been using it to explore for oil and gas. Uh, down throwing pressure enhanced fault nose traps of all uh, sizes have been discovered north of or southwest of what, what are they? They're down thrown fault of nose traps. And north of Dallas, that's not a small field. For a down thrown trap, because it's a three way trap against the fault, it's, it's not like you got an up thrown fault, you're sealing it. So there's a fault to the south, it's up thrown, but you're sealing against down thrown section. Now, part of the reason why that field is so big is that when, when you formed that diversion gravity, you dropped all that sand section right, and you juxtapose it right to the Naparima Hill source rocks. So you got your source section feeding right into all those sands. And that's why that feels so big. It's an impressive feel in the law. Overpressure and hand traps all occur in trustworthy deep water sediments, a feral field, now the field, Ecuador, uh, and it kind of reiterating all this stuff. In, in addition to more hydrocarbons being packed in the same reservoir space and overpressure reservoirs and normally pressure reservoir, Oil columns and overpressure enhanced oil and gas traps are much longer compared to oil, uh, oil and hydrocarbon traps and closing traps that are traps are only sealed by normally pressure seal. This greatly increases uh, average field EUR, EUR. And more importantly, one of the reasons why it does that is every fault block that comes in up thrown to that pressure climbing fault, every fault block has hydrocarbons in it. And the phenomenon occurs in basins that do or do not contain salt. Okay, I think I'm about through here. Uh, again, I, was, I, I demonstrated from that first session that uh, here's what you, how you can facilitate doing your studies on this, log analysis. I, I've not gone that much into log analysis other than shell resistivity ratio. Uh, Mary Vandeloup will go into that because that she, she has so more, more wells to go from uh, that she can show good examples. She's done a basin large study. Uh, you, go, you have to do subsurface mapping. Your reflection in my, uh, studies indicate that Here's all the things you use, okay? Seismic conversion, fault plane uh, polarity analysis and amplitude, seismic hydrocarbon chimney study, seismic acoustic P, seismic VPSV study. I did not discuss all this stuff because I didn't have time. Uh, and also I have to have you know, case studies I can actually put into it. Seismic interval velocity, this is very important, including velocity-induced reflection sag analysis, 
Remember how chocolate field, when you look at the time section, they would drill a long time. It's three, what, 600 acre structure, and you want a quarter royalty? Uh, you know, you just wouldn't do it. But they knew about that, and they knew they had a, they, the X, I trust me, Exxon knew they had a big one. Uh, seismic attribute studies, bright spots, flat spots, ABO absorption studies, acoustic speeds and studies. Absorption studies are especially because it tells you where the pressure is. Usually, when you get to a top of a pressure stream, you get a lot of absorption. And one of the reasons why you get a lot of gas is percolating up from that, uh, that, that, that cap rock, which gives you your source seal, and that tends to kind of cause problems. Most importantly, and most people don't understand this, geoscientists must create a top of hard pressure map to differentiate areas of pressure wall development, knowing that some normal faults will appear as reverse faults in this map, which is not always follows the horizon across fault. Now, you get a geophysicist, trust me, geophysicists don't like making a horizon on top of pressure. Number one, it's more interpretive. They can't just follow the same horizon. They have to jump from one horizon to the other. Then they have to determine which horizon they need to jump to. So all of a sudden, they're doing a double interpretation. I remember one time when I was mapping Bob Weider, I mapped that area in South Louisiana. And I'd done, done one of these pressure wall maps. And I, I actually mapped the top of pressure. I had a guy from upstairs working on the same project as me, a project to the north. He goes, that's an interesting map. And he goes, what is it? And I said, it's a pressure map. And, and, and he said, he looked at that map and he goes, well, hell, there, there's, there's two fault blocks in that pressure map that hadn't been produced yet. And I said, yeah, they're, they're going to work. You and I both are going to work. But the point is, at that point in time, we're doing Miami Corp. They wanted like 30% royalty. I said, you can't make money on it. That was for gas one. That was like 2003 or so, 2004. That was 2002, actually. I said, back then, I said, you just can't make money on it. Remember, we're not looking for oil and gas. We're looking for oil and gas by finding commercial and gas. Anyway, yes, uh, trust me, if GFS have not used to doing that, they'll whine a lot when they do it. And I'm, I'm a GFS. I spent 30 years in GFS. Uh, but you have to make this, 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 this fault, this pressure wall map. And sometimes it helps to color in the section to kind of on, on your, your demo slides so that people understand what the hell you're doing. Many of these geophysical methods are applied during the seismic processing phase. Keep in mind that you, 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 you'll probably have to go back and do some reprocessing, especially trying to do this fault plane analysis. The some are done using the seismic interpretation phase when potential hydrocarbon prospect leaders begin to be singled out for further development economic de-risking. And that's what we're all about, people. Uh, we want things to be de-risked. We're going to management ask for expensive hole to be drilled. Some, most of these wells are probably going to be drilled, uh, 14,000 foot plus. So the least you're going to have is, is intermediate well. Most of them are deep. So you want to be able to de-risk and explain why you think it works. And, and it does work. Essentially, the combined geophysical mask and geology science an effective wild card or, or, or ongoing search for pilot commercial hard carbon traps. And, and really, what the, most of what all this is about, I've been trying to show you how to do this. No one showed me how to do that. I figured it out myself. But uh, I'm getting old, so I'm willing to share all this stuff now kind of part of my secret sauce. And now to discuss next, I may have probably figured a lot of this stuff out for herself. Overpressuring also occurs in Paleozoic older sediments. Now, a French company drilled an onshore Mauritania well. They were drilling uh, pr uh, Proterozoic rocks. And we're talking really old rocks. And they, they knew they had a source rock down in Proterozoic. They did not allow for pro, uh, overpressure because they figured any overpressure down there probably didn't relieve this Proterozoic, right? Now, the, the structure they, they had was probably more likely uh, Cenozoic, but they're doing Proterozoic rocks. And I think they're, uh, they're drilling the front of a uh, Forlid Basin. So for, when the same started loading it up, before that, the, the source rock not generated, but once you loaded it up on Cenozoic session, all of a sudden the source rock starts generating. They drilled a, a well to less than uh, uh, 5,000 feet, that well cost them more than $100 million because they didn't allow for the overpressure. Think about that. A 5,000 foot well, in order to control it and get the hell away from it, cost them over $100 million because they just didn't use, uh, they, they, they didn't consider overpressure. So you always consider overpressure, whether you're dealing with Pleistocene rocks or Proterozoic rocks. You better damn sure know where overpressure is, or at least theorize it could be there. Well, data from the NODR from the Arkema Basin, USA Midcontinent, as well as the Korean Basin in West Texas indicate overpressure zones have been depleted. A portion of these basins are resolved with laramide uplift and erosion. If you go to the NODR, uh, the Arkema Basin, 
you have a limited uh, pressure cell you have in the inner dark loop. But when you go over the arcoma, you had, you had an overpressured sequence, overpressure enhanced traps back in, uh, in at the end of uh, within Permian time. But by by beginning of Triassic time, no later than beginning of Triassic time, you started forming the Gulf of Mexico. That whole area is uplift as part of the basin rim. When that happened, all that overpressure is bled off. So now you have a paleo overpressure sound, but it's not pressured anymore. And oh, by the way, when you get into these, whether you're in the uh, normal pressure zone or paleo overpressure zone, when you get into these sandstones within the overpressure zone, usually a better process of permeability than sands outside the zone. In other words, because you're in a situation where the sand's sealed, but you're not moving a lot because you have gas or oil in it, you're not dropping off as much uh, cement in the damn sand. As a consequence, uh, you, you keep your processing and permeability. And that works also in the Arcoma basin. You get in that paleo overpressure zone. You have better processing permeability in that paleo overpressure zone, even though it's not only pressure now, than you do in the stuff surrounding it. I think that's my last slide. So I actually, I think it's Mary. <laughs>